let me continue the uh, uh, the band theory. Okay, so in the last class, I explained the meaning of the dense double state and the different characteristic of the SP band and the D band. Please keep in mind, in an SP band, it's more conductive and the electron belong to the SP band have uh, some uh, pre-electron-like characteristic and they have a, a large beta, the hopping energy means it's easily moving around the each side. And because of this large beta, uh, they have a, a large bandwidth and a small density will say. But in a D-band, D-band, which one is important in the magnetism, they are well localized and uh, they have a relatively small beta, means the hopping is not easy. So that means the conductivity is small. And also the bandwidth is uh, narrow, and as a result, we have a large density of state. This is uh, something like D-band. Okay. And we already learned about the characteristic of the D-band, which one is localized. The, the D orbit is localized in a function of the radius. The wave function of D-band is usually very well localized. So let me ask one question. If you have a Gaussian distribution in an excess space, real space, what is the uh, period transform of its distribution in a case space? Momentum space is same to the also the Gaussian, but the difference is uh, the line width. Here let's call delta x, and this is uh, let's say delta p. They satisfy the uncertainty principle. Like this, so this implies if delta x is larger. Delta P is getting smaller. So if we have a well-defined localized wave function here, then we have a more broad wave function in a real, real space, the, the moment space here. <clears throat> so in a D-band, they well localized data means they are spread out in a K space. But in a S electron, they are well uh, spread out in a real space. They are more localized in a K space. So that's the result of the large beta. That's the result of the small beta. So they are all in the okay. So now So this is the typical example of density state, density state of the S electron and D electrons. Okay. So let's move on uh, next important concept called the Fermi surface. Fermi surface is the uh, if we have a band structure or density state here. When we fill out the energy, the, the electron, we have a, a certain surface here. That's what we call Fermi surface. So they are uh, they can be happen because the electron occupy from the lowest energy state, and it's like a, a set of seed. They are filling the, uh, filling from the best view. So. If the number of electron is less than the total possible state, or the number of audience is smaller than the number of seed, then they are partially occupied, something like this. So the Fermi energy means energy of the highest occupied energy state, and is just think think about the atomic case. If we have several uh, orbitals. 
but most of the interaction occurred in outer shell because they are uh, lowest energy, so they can, they can eat, uh, highest energy, so they can take out the outer electron very easily. So the electron affinity and ionization energy are all determined in this outer shells. It's the same. So, uh, in a solid or condensed matter, the Fermi surface or Fermi energy is very, very important. So the Fermi surface means the uh, uh, energy surface in a K-space. So that's not, uh, I'm going to show some example. Okay, so let's back to the 2D case. Uh, we already know the energy of the 2D electron band such as uh, something like this here. And if you uh, assume the this small filling case means we have a band structure something like this, energy, the number will be very small. So only those parts are occupied. So that means we can take out the approximation because we know the K, Ka is small in this case. So, you know, cosine can take out the such well known approximation. So, with those approximations, we have form. Okay. So in this case, if we uh, assume the k value satisfied those values, let's say kf, and there is a relation between the Fermi surface momentum vector and the energy, Fermi energy, and then we can rewrite this form by assumption of the same x y component. Okay. And you can easily see the Fermi surface form a circle. Yeah, this is the kind of the uh, equation for the circle. And the radius is depends on we can find the radius of the circle is here. So this is the point of piece, and also in this uh, two-dimensional plot, I'm sorry, this should be uh, something like here. Okay, so that's the uh, example of the small filling case for the Fermi uh, surface. And let's think about the half filling case. Now we have an electron, more electrons, so electrons fill out this part. So in this case, the Fermi energy is approximately alpha. Yeah. That means they should be zero. Those terms should be zero. So that means the Kx and Ky should uh, satisfy pi over plus minus pi over a. Sorry, I missed the symbol for the equal. In this case, the Fermi surface is almost a square, something like this. So, you know, Two-dimensional case, they form something like this. So this cartoon, this flat, is a real shape of the Fermi surface when we have a half-filling case. Actually, Fermi surface is three-dimensional structure, but that is not easy to imagine. 
So many times we show the Fermi surface as a cross section of this three dimensional plus. But nowadays, with the three dimensional uh, image tools, I'm going to show it, uh, you can see the real three dimensional structure of the Fermi surface more easily. Okay, let's think of the next case, the almost full filling case. Now we have a Fermi surface here and all this data occupied. And that means, um, now, k value is almost pi over a, but let's, let's be small. So let's assume the, there is some new variable delta. So we can take in some approximation here. So you can easily imagine there are also circles, but uh, different center. So we have a circles here, 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 and here. So we have a Fermi surface is four. Okay. So I I show the, some example of the shape of Fermi surface in some interesting case like a small filling, a half filling, a full filling. Why that is the important? As I already mentioned, in most cases, the electron on a Fermi surface are only interacting with the external perturbation, means the electric field or magnetic field, or if there are some photons. Many properties of the solid state are response on a Fermi surface. And also the response function, the susceptibility for the electric field, magnetic field, and many things came from the Fermi surface characteristic. But if you working on more high energy perturbation, like, like a high energy uh, X-ray, then you can see the core electron property. But many of the uh, properties came from the Fermi surface. So study about the Fermi surface is very important. So it is especially important in a transport property, which is the response of the electric field and the magnetism and uh, the tunneling effect, which is also belong to the kind of transport properties. So the Fermi surface is something like a uh, water surface in a basket. So if we have uh, this shape of basket and those amount of the water, we have uh, this shape. But you know, even though you have the uh, same uh, number of electrons, if the basket shape is different, the Fermi surface area and shape will be different. And as I already mentioned, in a real system, it is three-dimensional surface. So I'm going to show some examples. This is the typical example of the alkali metals and the copper. You know, alkali metals, there is only one uh, balanced electron, so it's corresponding to a small filling case, small filling case here, small filling case. So they are very small circles. So they are corresponding to small filling. And copper is the almost full filling. Those parts are pressing part. Okay, I'm going to show more example. This is the period table of the uh, home of the period table for the Fermi surface. All those alkali metals have a very similar shape. And if you increase the number of electrons, they are different form, but you can see there is some common point in our in our same column. Here we have a very similar forming surface. Right? And also if you take a group more uh, forming surface here. All those uh, same columns have very similar 
Promis for peace. Yeah, thank you. And also, I want to show this website, this very uh, meaningful for students. So, Okay, so this is the web page. I uh, have a link, uh, PowerPoint, as you see here. You can see uh, many uh, farming surface, especially uh, for the ferromatic material. We have a different farming surface for the spin up and spin down for the iron and cobalt up spin and down spin nickel case here. Okay, so if you have a different uh, uh, crystal structure, like uh, uh, yeah, there's some other structure of spheres, we have a different form of also. Oh, good question. This means different band structure. I'm going to show more details here. So uh, let me ask a student. Uh, there are many, many. There are many uh, materials. Uh, do you see more details, any materials? Please pick some, maybe two or three elements. Please type it. Name of element, you want to take a more, more careful look. Do you want know, to see iron? Okay, cobalt. Do you want know, to see up or down? Okay. Iron up and cobalt down, and then. Okay, so let me see. Let me click the iron up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can download some files by the clicking the uh, clicking the this link and just a moment. So you guys want uh put down okay, so let me start uh the easy one you just turn the copper. Can you guys see the form surface of copper? Yeah, with this application, you can uh, turn around the, the form surface, or uh, you can see the labels. 
of the Fermi surface here. Kappa is the FCC structure, so I already showed this kind of a name convention in a previous cl class. And you can see the, some plans here, just a moment. So in when you take a look the uh, the the Fermi surface in a textbook, they show usually show the two-dimensional case. So and also you can see more structure here. So those shape. If we have a more so Fermi surface here, we have a have a shape of something like this. That's the, what we call the dogobon. In Korean word, kebyeokdagi. That's the funny name. The physicist uh, put such kind of funny, funny name for, uh, for small form. Okay, so that's the shape of the Fermi surface. Um, And let me show other case, the ion case. Yeah, this is the uh, ion case. It's much more complicated, right? It is the uh, ion of case. And you can see this part, this yellow part, they, uh, yeah, they are, means they are almost a filling band, band three. And band four is almost, uh, maybe half filling, five band, band five, they are almost filling case. Yeah, band six is also same. So, if we're taking more case, let's see, this is very, uh, you know, in some sense, it's beautiful. Um, if we're taking out the uh, uh, some. Surface. So you can imagine uh, what's the meaning of the Fermi surface case. Okay. And finally, I'm going to show cobalt. Cobalt is a HSP, so for this piece, it looks more different. And there are more bands here. You can uh, you can see the change of the uh, for piece. If you uh, adjust this. This bar, you can see the difference and this more easily. Okay. So if you take a look at uh, each band, then you can more easily imagine the uh, structure. So this side is very uh, useful when you're studying the Fermi surface. Okay, so let's back the A point.
So I hope now the student gets some feeling about the, what is the form is surface. Do you have any question about the form is surface? Okay. Oh, by the way, in our last class, I'm sorry, I forgot it. In our last class, Dong Yun asked me one simple question. Why the beta value is always negative? But uh, I didn't explain. So this is the explanation here. Okay. In the last class, I explained about the uh, hydrogen molecule case with the eigenfunction of each atoms. And here, beta, beta is determined by the hopping matrix between two atoms. So, uh, let me think about that. The beta is the... Uh, the defined by state uh, first atom and the second atom and you know Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is uh, the you can realize the Hamiltonian is from here V1 and V2 are potential because of the uh, atomic one and, and and second atom and those part are kinetic energy of the electrons. So we can separate this Hamiltonian, this part, and this part. And we can rewrite here. And the first part is nothing else but the H1 Hamiltonian here. So we have a division. Or we can say yeah. we can say same. So we have uh, this term. And this is the scalar, the ES is pops out. So that means this term is and they are zero. So only we have a remaining part here. And the V2 is the Coulomb potential because of the second atoms. So they are always negative. And also the 1s electron is always positive. We assume the 1s. So the total result is always negative value. So, not if the orbit is not the uh, 1s, let's say p or 3d, in a p orbital case, if we have a, let's say p, p we have a sign for plus minus. And if we have another atoms, p orbitals, we have a uh, plus minus. So in this case, we have a beta is positive. So that means the band for this interaction gives us some inverted shape. So you can see in real band structure, sometimes we have a those shape. But those shape is actually came from the uh, extension of this band by the uh, reduced symmetry. So they are all related together. Okay. Okay. 
So, uh, so this is the uh, simple expansion of the density of state for this many kind of CD metals. It's very simplified form. The alkali metals we have only S band. Only S band here. And in you know, a noble metals like a copper or silver, they have a S band and D band, but D band are all fielded. That implies the D band does contribute to the forming surface. So they are not contribute to the conductivity of the solid state. And other typical 3D metals, like vanadium, the band, the forming surface is in a D band. And in a ferromagnetic material, we have a spin up and spin down state. So we can write, we can uh, see the forming surface for spin up and spin down state respectively. So, you know, uh, let's say in a spin up state, the D band are all fielded, while the down state, we have a partially fielded D band. That implies in a forming surface, the number of down state are larger than number of up state. But in a total number of electrons for up spin and the down spin, so the total number of electrons for the up spin and down spin, we have a large, uh, large number of the up spins. But in a dense tube state, The Fermi surface for spin up and spin down. In this case, they are larger. So, in a conductivity, the down spin contributes more, while the total number of electrons spin up is larger. So, some magnetic properties determined by the total num number of electrons. Some magnetic property determined by the, the number of electrons at the Fermi surface. For example, let's think about a simple magnetic property called the conductivity. By the Drude model, that's the free electron model, then we have uh, this relation. The conductivity is proportional to the number of electrons and the charge square and tau means the scattering time between each collision and inversely proportional to the m star here the m star is corresponding is the called the effective mass And also the tau is the uh, collision time. So one of the tau is proportional to the scattering potential and the number of electrons at the Fermi surface. So that means, you know, usually the S band has a small density of state compared to the D band. So that means Ns is than Nd in many cases. So that implies the the tau for the the inverse tau for the D is larger. So that means tau is small for the D band. Okay. So that means the conductivity of D band is usually smaller than S band. And this number here, this number is the uh, resistivity, which one is the inverse of the conductivity. All right? 
So that means they are proportional to the time in both. So we have a large E and for the D band, we have a large E resistivity, much larger. And also, we also think about the effect of mass. The Fleetron model is a probably band structure. Is smaller and conduct small conductivity means large resistivity. This is the resistivity value. Okay, let's back to the effective mass again. So let's think about this parabola. If we have a two parabola. And let's say this is a A1k square, this is A2k square. And you can easily see A2 is larger than A1. And in this case, A is corresponding to this part. So M star is inversely of the description. Or in other words, M will determine the curvature of this parabola. So that means usually we have a flat band for the D band. It's very flat. So that means M is larger than S band as usual. So you can easily see D band has less conductivity. That means, you know, we already mentioned the D band is a uh, uh, small beta, small beta, that means less conductivity. That means uh, band is flat and the effective mass is large. The large effective mass means if you apply the same force, they are not easy to move it. But all connected. So by this simple band model, you easily understand the property of the D band and S band and many more. Okay. And finally, I wanna explain about this. How about the conductivity of the spin up and spin down case? They have a different number of bands of state. And yeah, actually detail structure, band structure is also a little bit different. But anyway, the most part is came from those difference. The conductivity of the spin up, spin down are also different. Reason we have a magnetic, magnetic resistance in ferromagnetic materials. Yeah, I'm gonna explain it later more, more details. So, um, so far we are talking about a very simple case for each band, 4S and 3D. This is the uh, interatomic distance. And from the well defined uh, separate orbital, is changed to the band structure. And as you see here, this 3D band and 4S band are close to each other. So that means usually two bands are missing in real case. So that's what you call the hybridization of the bands. So sometimes we, in a simple model, we can clearly separate the S band and D band, but in many cases, they are mixed out. So if we have a simple S band, but we have a 
mixture of the uh, this two band 3D and 4S case. Okay. So so far, I explained the band structure with a very very simple approximation, and the real band structure is much more complicated. But I hope my lecture is helpful for the student to understand the meaning of a band structure. Yeah, usually the experimentalist, uh, we don't need to uh, understand the very details of the band structure, but sometimes we have to catch some physics from the band structure calculations. This is the end of the uh, band simple band structure example. And let's move on to the final subtopic of the uh, page of the magnetism. Do you have any questions about the band structure? Okay, if you have any question, uh, I'm going to give a chance at uh, my lecture again. So now I finished all these topics, origin of the magnetism and base of quantum mechanics and the simple band theory. Now I'm going to start about the origin of magnetism again. And not the classical feature. Now I'm I want to talk about the quantum feature, especially for the 3D metal case. Which one is important in a uh, uh, spin electronics? Okay, so what we already did is uh, we explained the uh, magnetism by the classical physics, but we're gonna do it again by the quantum mechanics. Yeah, there are many common points, but with without quantum mechanics. Uh, we cannot explain the uh, many things in the magnetism. Okay, and also we already learned about the band theory and the quantum mechanics. So I'm gonna explain the magnetism based on the quantum mechanics and the band theory. So um, the origin of magnetism is spin. We already mentioned it. I mean, which one is a pure quantum mechanical quantity? Yeah, and also, um, in order to understand uh, magnetism, we need the band theory. Okay. Okay, let's back to the uh, this picture. This one is the classical expression. We already learned the atomic moment are random without any external magnetic field. So the total average value is going to zero, but when you apply the magnetic field, there's a non-zero component, the direction of the magnetism, magnetic field, that's what you call the paramagnetism. And I already asked the student to uh, take in these integrals by yourself at Homo, and you can obtain the, this relation, the Langevin functions. That's the classical paramagnetism. Now, what's the difference in a quantum magnetism? In a classical picture, without, zero, uh, without external field, the moment is random. But in a finite external magnetic field, we have a non-zero average. In, in this case, the energy state of the each moment, they are, if they have a different uh, direction, the energy is continuous because they have a oscillation. If the magnetic moment direction are continuous, then the energy spectrum is continuous. But in a quantum mechanics, the direction of the magnetic moment are quantized. They are not a continuous one. And even though we apply the magnetic field, we already learned the uh, uh, angular, angular momentum magnetic quantum number, they are all quantized. So the energy level is also quantized. So 
So you know classical parameterism we have those integrals, but you know uh, quantum mechanics this integral we have to replace by the summation. So that kind of thing is usually happens when we think about the quantum mechanics. So instead of this integral, if you take in the summation, we obtain uh, Boolean function instead of the Langevin function. Let's change to bj. Okay, and the Boolean function is defined here. And as you see here, we have a similar term cotangent to the Langevin function. But we have something more here. And please remember that this x value is also ratio between the multi g man energy and the thermal energy. There's a new quantity called j, j. J, j is nothing but the total angular momentum. So, this Boolean function has a different value for each given j. So, in, if we have a day of the half, we have a such curve. This is bj. And for the large j, if j is getting larger and larger, then we have this form, and when j is going to infinite, can you really see this term is going to 1? And this is disappeared, and uh, if you take in the uh, approximation for the large j, this term, they turn out to j over x. So 2j are cancelled out, this one. So we have a 1 over x, like a Langevin function. That means if we take in the j to the infinite, bj is turn out to the Langevin function. So that's uh, similar in many quantum mechanical results. You can continuously changing by the limit case, you can obtain the classical physics result. So that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. And also, you know, J is half case. We can uh, simplify the brilliant function to tangent. Yeah, you can do it by yourself. So, even though we have a little difference here for the classical physics and the quantum mechanics, but the same, the main story are not changed. So that means for the small x case, that means we have a uh, higher temperature compared to the G minus energy. Then Bj can be we can take the approximation. That means the susceptibility of this paramagnetism, we have uh, this form. Yeah, this is a little bit complicated, but it's quite similar to the part one, but we have a little difference in a J term. Okay. So, uh, for the large X case, for the large X case, that means we have a large Magnetic moment or large magnetic field compared to the thermal energy. The magnetic moment we have this form. And for the large J, means the classical limit, the Boolean function is turns out to the Langevin function. So we have a dissolution. And if we have a j is half, 
that means it's quantum mechanical. They are very similar, but the different at this point. Okay. So they are similar, but uh, the details are a little bit different. And also, I have to mention about the Pauli, magnet, Pauli paramagnetism in a band structure. In a band structure, we have to think about the energy distribution, follow the Fermi distribution. And yeah, I will skip the details, but uh, in this case, we obtain the susceptibility, which one is independent on the temperature. Yeah, usually we have a temperature dependent susceptibility here. But in a uh, paramagnetism for the band structure, we have a uh, very similar form, but a little bit different. They are not depend on the temperature. Here, the T is the, called the Fermi temperature defined by uh, Fermi energy of the system. Yeah, you don't need to uh, remember such details, but just uh, there are many kinds of definition of the susceptibility for the different model. So um, let's think about the uh, uh, ferromagnetism for the quantum mechanism. Yeah, so far I explained about the paramagnetism. So when we uh, go into the ferromagnetism, J is here. Yeah. Total angular J is the total angular moment. And that's the sum of the L plus S. And you, we know the S is the spin angular momentum is half. And the L is almost zero in many 3D metals. So that means in many ferromagnetic material, they have a J is half. So uh, uh, the multi moment of the ferromagnetic material, many metals, they are belong to the J is half case. You're going to see uh, more details in a uh, Later. Okay, so I want to uh, recall this curve for the uh, Boolean functions. Yeah, in a previous case, we uh, play with the Langevin function. Only difference is the different curve. Instead of the Langevin function, we are using the Boolean functions. And uh, if we're taking the same uh, logic, in classical ferromagnetism case, you can obtain the magnetic moment as a function of the temperature. So please remember that uh, for the nickel case, this curve is what you obtained by the by the classical model, or the J is infinite case. But if you calculate the same thing for the J is half case, you can see this motion. This is quantum observation is much well explained by this model, the quantum mechanics model. So, if you understand the quantum mechanical model, yeah, it's not uh, correct any for most of the cases. You have to think about this case. So. Mind here, yeah. J is case here. Then the Boolean function turns out to more simple case here. And uh, in many matters, even though sometimes we have a one or uh, even uh, 
none have uh, there are some cases we are not uh, j's hat case but uh, the infinite case is very uh, extreme case so usually we play with uh, this So, um, there's one more. In a, a quantum mechanics, we have to think about the collectible excitation. That's the meaning of the magnum. That's the quantization of the spin wave. So, what's the meaning of this uh, magnum or collective excitation? Yeah, that is very simple explanation. Okay, let's back to this uh, temperature dependence mountain moment. You know, um, this curve, this curve, you can obtain by uh, uh, Q by slow. Based on this Q by slow, if you calculate the delta M, which one is the change of the mountain moment because of the temperature change is defined by this one. And the reduce, reduced moment is because of the thermal energy. And they are basically from the Boltzmann contribution. So they have a such exponential term. And this thermal motion means thermal motion means the direction of the magnetic moment are random, random. They are randomly fluctuate each other. So the all this direction of the spin because of the thermal motion are totally random. Yeah, that sounds good, but in a reality. There is a strong coupling between spins, the neighboring spins. So instead of such random fluctuation, if they form some correlated thermal fluctuation, we can lower energy. So that means it's more stable. That means spin is uh, randomly fluctuated, but the motion are correlated. So such correlated motion is uh, we can quantize such correlated motion. It's called the magnum. And this magnum behaves quite similar to the phone. Instead of the, this spin motion, if we think about the uh, vibration of the atoms, yeah, they are also the same. The vibration of atoms is random. But each atom are coupled to each other. They are strongly connected. So the motion of the uh, atom is not really random. They have some correlation. That's the meaning of the phonon. So because of this collective excitation, we can lower the system energy. So the magnetic moment is determined by not the random thermal motion, but by the correlate thermal motion. So that's what we call the spin wave. And we calculate this spin wave motion. Then the delta M variation is we can find T over three, uh, T power to uh, one uh, three, two, four. Okay. Obtain this one. Such temperature dependence is experimentally well explained. Uh, well observed in many, many parametric materials. So this is what you call the spin wave. Yeah, the theory of spin wave is very important in a ferromagnetic system, but now uh, we are only talking about the origin of the ferromagnetic system, so I'm going to uh, finish about the spin wave theory. If we have a, a time, maybe end of this semester, I'm going to explain spin wave again. And please remember that this magnon is kind of quartz particle in a solid, especially in a magnetic material, and they are very important to understand many my properties. 
Okay, so uh, um, I should explain about the spin orbit interaction. Uh, we are talking about the total angular momentum, which means sum of the angular momentum and the spins. But in there is some energy between the uh, coupling between the orbital motion and the spin motion. Those two angular momenta are interact with each other. And also this spin orbit coupling, spin orbit interaction are source of the many, many magnetic properties. Yeah, I didn't explain yet what is uh, anisotropy and such things, but they are very important property for the ferromagnetic materials, and they are all related with the spin orbit interaction. So uh, here I'll just uh, briefly touch what's the meaning of the spin orbit coupling. Okay, so uh, we have a uh, nucleus and the angular motion of electron. That's the, our view. So usually we uh, model this one to there is some sun and we have us here. Us is turning around the sun. But if you take a look at the sun on the earth, what happens if we have us, us here, you are here. The sun is moving. The earth is not moving. It's the same. If you think about your electron, then this motion seems like the motion of the nucleus. And then we have a plus charge, uh, which one is turning around your cell. So this current will generate magnetic field. So in the viewpoint of the electron, they feel effective magnetic field. And this magnetic field is determined by the angular motion of the electron itself. But uh, the motion of the nucleus is just a, a counter a result of the motion of the electron, so they so relate to the orbital motion of this cell. So the effective field is related to the angular motion, and there is a uh, Marty moment of the electron, so that's we have uh, the inner product term between the L dot S. So the energy because of the spin of the coupling is expressed by this form. We have uh, L dot S here. Okay. And this C, the speed of velocity, implies this is came from the relative state theory. Okay, so this uh, angular momentum term, no, I'm sorry, the spin of coupling term is appeared in many, many places, but please keep in mind, this spin of interaction is very important in our magnetic system. Okay. So far, I explained the origin of the phenomenon system based on the classical physics and the quantum mechanics. But in that model, we assumed some parallel orientation of each spins. If we have two spins, we assumed some interactions. In previous case, in a molecular field theory, we called that's the uh, extra molecular field, and they are proportional to the magnetic moment. And I said this lambda, in a classical model, they are order of one. But experimentally, they we found the value must be around the thousand. And that time I didn't explain why. So I'm gonna explain why that interaction happens. That's what you call the exchange coupling. So yeah, we just assume the molecular field, which we don't know, but now I want to say the extrapling is the origin of such interaction, and this came from the interacting uh, electron uh, interaction between the electrons, and the electron is not uh, distinguishable. Electrons are indistinguishable. That's a very important concept. 
in a quantum physics. Okay, let's think about that. If we have a, uh, uh, H2 molecules, let's say that one. Okay. So far, we ignore the interaction between electrons. Yeah, in, in previous case, we just assumed the two potential energy because of the atom, the, the nucleus of each atoms. But the, there is some interaction between two electrons. Okay, and let's uh, define the H0 for these two independent Hamiltonian H0, and let's turn on the vector. So this case, this is the uh, wave function of the uh, this uh, hydrogen uh, molecules. There is some two electrons, and uh, yeah, if there is a non interacting electrons, then we have a total energy of the sum of each each electrons. Okay. Here, let's think about the total energy. This should be plus interaction terms here. Called the Cij. We have a uh, uh, two electrons and wave functions here. Yeah, if we have an uh, interaction of this Coulomb form, then the energy have an extra term. So they are a little bit different. Okay, they are a little bit increase of the energy. Because the we have a plus sign here, we are same charge for the electrons. This one is a negative one, but this one is positive because it's a repulsive force between two electrons. Okay. But in this case, we didn't think about the power exclusion principles. So because of the power exclusion principles, and we have to think about the parity of the electron, which one is the electron is the fermion. So we have an extra term for the single state and the triple state. Here, the J is uh, here. The in a Coulomb interaction, the C, C is what we call Coulomb interaction. If you interchange two electrons, these two electrons, actually we cannot distinguish these two states. So we have to think about this case also. So this is the call exchange term. Exchange means these two electrons, number one, we replace by number two, and this two is replaced by the number one. So that's the meaning of the exchange. So if you turn on this exchange term, the total energy is different for spin state. If we have a, uh, when we have a J is negative case, the antiparallel is more stable and parallel are unstable. But if J is positive case, the parallel are sta stable and antiparallel are unstable. So, for simple model, as a result, we have a such Hamiltonian. The, if we have uh, two spins with the inner product, that means the system energy, uh, let's assume the J is positive case. Then when they are parallel, we have all energy because of this minus sign. 
but if j is negative, negative, the spin must be anti-parallel to get a lower energy. So in a ferromagnetic material, this j value are positive, and the spin prepares the parallel orientation. That's the origin of the molecular field. And in that case, the magnitude of the interaction is quite well matched with the experimental observation. So the, now the lambda is 10 to, 10 to 3. That makes sense. The transcoupling model is not easy one to understand. So, but Remember this result. That's what you call the Heisenberg Hamiltonian, and that, that's the very basic uh, pr property of the <coughs> ferromagnetism. Oh, sorry. Uh, please ask uh, some questions. <laughs> that is a very good question. Yeah, in many physics, actually, uh, we don't know classical physics, but it's more easy to understand. And also, uh, in a limit case, many uh, properties can be explained by the classical physics. So if you uh, start directly by the quantum mechanics, it's not easy. So that's why we introduced the classical physics. Yeah. <clears throat> But that's a good question, actually. Yeah, most of the book uh, follow the way, so that's how I did it. But yeah, maybe we don't need a classical explanation. Maybe you know, next uh, uh, year, if I give the same lecture, I really, really think about it just to skip the classical part. That's a good point. Thank you, Changang. Okay, um, if you don't have uh, any more questions, I will close this lecture. And there's two uh, comments. Um, I'm going to upload this uh, 50 file in our LMS system after this class. And also for the midterm exam, I really think about that, uh, but uh, it's not a good idea taking some uh, midterm exam in this case. So. Skip the midterm exam, but I will give you some homeworks and we're gonna have a final exam. So, yeah, sorry about this, but uh, if you have uh, some midterm exam, yeah, it's not easy to give us some uh, problems for the examination. So, yeah, I will skip it. But during this midterm exam uh, week, I'm not sure we will gonna have a class or not. I'm gonna notice it. Yeah. Okay, then. Okay, so I'm gonna close the, this uh, lecture. Bye, and see you next Monday.